conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, April 30th, 2020. I'm Michael Brooks. This is a Michael Thursday. We're still in quarantine, circling the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA, on this today, on today's program. Kurt Hackbarth will talk about Corona in Mexico, how U.S. foreign policymakers potentially, Mexican elites definitely, are attempting to use the crisis to pursue an agenda of toppling Mexico's left-wing president. And how exactly is AMLO's record on Corona anyway? Tenants. The landlords are bracing for the largest rent strike in decades. That's right. Turn necessity into a strike. Amazon, Walmart, and FedEx workers are planning a walkout on Friday, tomorrow, May 1st. Got to support them, folks. Everybody join the boycott. Don't order anything from Amazon. Amazon proving once again to be perhaps the most dangerous private dictatorship in the world is cracking down on internal communication after a surge in worker activism. Donald Trump, not happy, been presented with very bad and not good polling numbers, suggesting that his reelection chances are slipping away and GOP senators also starting to get very concerned about the midterms, even as Democratic frustration mounts as the Biden campaign remains radio silent on the sexual assault allegation leveled against him by Tara Reid. Trump's appointees manipulated CFPB payday lending research and next staff for claims. Bolsonaro says, so what? To Brazil's rising Corona death toll. And Corona has forced a, a delay in the US extradition in the profoundly dangerous anti-journalistic case against Julian Assange, who is still being held in inhumane and dangerous conditions inside the UK. Joe Biden says he would leave the US Embassy in, in Jerusalem if elected, even as a new Israeli uh, coalition government starts to formalize apartheid policies. And Congress quietly boosts spending on lawmakers' exclusive concierge health clinic. That's great. As 70% of tested inmates in federal prisons have COVID-19. All that and much, much more on today's Majority Report. Greetings, Matt. Greetings, Brendan. How are you guys? Uh, I'm doing well, Michael. How about yourself? Uh, well, good so far because the internet is, is holding up. Brendan, how you doing? I did a internet dance right before we started. Uh, the stream today and i have to say it's working so far yes and we're excited and we're excited and we're looking at it very strongly wait no we're it's working and we're excited is a kushner uh right? yeah I that's, Cam, a, that's, that's not kushner precisely one. it but that's close yeah it's working it's working it. and we're very excited and we're very excited yeah. that's what it is did. that's what I did the dance to help with connectivity, of course. <laughs> oh, yeah, to help with connectivity. To help with connectivity. We've had Mark Zuckerberg around here, just helping. He's a helpful guy. <laughs> yeah, he's an extremely helpful guy. So um, a whole bunch of new webcams installed. Right. <laughs> right. 
I think we, at some point we all need to look at some uh, open source alternatives to Zoom, guys, if we're going to start uh, living our whole lives on these platforms for the, you know, at least another several months. Yeah. Um, I should also say, I can't believe I missed it, but uh, another over uh, 3 million more people uh, applied uh, are, are jobless um, as we head towards that catastrophic $40 million, uh, 40 million unemployment number. Just to reinforce, it just needs to be said constantly and with relentless repetition. This is, the, obviously, the medical crisis, the pandemic itself is not easily solvable. That's going to require uh, you know, scientific collaboration, research, international coordination, all the rest of it. But we could give people two grand a month, suspend rent, and not backdate it like there's not going to be any rent for the next several months. If you're a mom and pop landlord, we can subsidize you. We can actually cover people's full rent. If you're a big land, you know, if you're a big real estate uh, conglomerate, you're going to have to eat the loss on this one. Sorry, uh, we should be breaking you up, and you shouldn't be allowed to exist anyway. Uh, that would actually be relatively easy to figure out if we got into it on a policy level. And folks could stay home. And then, of course, we would need hazard pay and serious protections for essential workers and so on. But the, the challenge of how to keep people fed and housed and participating in not spreading a pandemic is solvable like that. And we see many different places. I mean, even in Vietnam, they coordinate home food delivery, for God's sakes. They do this. I mean, you know, we've seen the testing deployment in South Korea and China. We've seen the coordination. I mean, in South Korea and Taiwan, we've seen a similar coordination in terms of food delivery in China. Uh, and, uh, you know, this just it, it just it's very important. Anytime somebody tells you that some situation is just hard or impossible to solve, it isn't. It's actually conceptually incredibly easy. The policy mechanisms might be hard to figure out because as Mark Blythe and others have pointed out, essentially the only thing we're designed to do is pump money into the banking system and other monopolistic interests. But if we got serious about getting the pipes right, we could get money to people and folks could stay home and eat and be where and be safe. This is yeah. not that hard. Yeah, it's a choice. I mean, you know, we talk about how, it's a, it's not even a failure of imagination. It's a failure of people standing in the way we could just have, you know, um, postal service bank accounts that, uh, yep. Oh, guess what? Your postal service bank account has 2000 more dollars in it, uh, on the first. Yep. It, and no. that's going to roll for a year. And also, you know, and again, we're, we're coordinating home deliveries. Now we don't want to just go back to normal. Obviously there's a ton of policy innovations internationally, nationally, and locally that could generate out of this to make a much more equitable, interesting, ecologically sensitive world. And that's what we have to be thinking about and doing. But the immediate, you just stay home and don't worry about this, is a completely artificial and brutal crisis in the United States, completely. And folks need to remember that um, and remember where to point the blame at. Now, Donald Trump is uh, not doing too well. There was a period of time uh, at the beginning of this crisis where his poll numbers are actually unusually high. I think it's important for people to look at Trump's uh, numbers generally in two ways. One, for the you know resistance people who, you know of course, hate Trump and Trump's utterly loathsome and all the rest of it. We know all of this. Uh, he's not a uniquely unpopular president. It's important to remember that. And that's not just with his base to the extent that there's sort of, you know, I wouldn't even call them swing voters. I would call them sort of, you know, I don't even know how you define it, but there are some people who you could define as being in some sort of middle, a grab bag of politics. They don't necessarily like Trump at all, but they don't hate him in the same way uh, that maybe you or I would. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, he isn't popular. And never has been particularly popular. I mean, this is a guy whose numbers are usually in the 40s. 
And he's generating from a fervent base that he has an incredible ability to communicate with. And of course, maybe the most ineffectual, embarrassing opposition party in modern political history. So those are the dynamics. In the beginning of the crisis, his numbers went up because he's the president, because he's out in front of it rhetorically, and because of course the Democrats have no leadership or strategy ever. And at the same time, there is just, there is raw objective realities and we're in an immense, public health and economic crisis, this guy let it happen. And it doesn't matter how much bloviating he does. It's very easy for people to figure out, including people who might be sympathetic to him, his egotism, recklessness, and stupidity that accelerated where we're at. And that's showing up in the numbers. You know, a lot of people, I would say, obviously people in 2016 were delusionally complacent about him not winning. I see certain contingents of people who are, frankly, way too confident that he's going to lose re-election. If we have an election and the trends stay and we have an election, Donald Trump's going to lose. And the reporting is reflecting that. Donald Trump does not like that reporting. And uh, first, let's actually start with... uh, this two minute segment that Brian Williams, who as we'll get to in a minute is uh, in fact, I think he is a pretty publicly dem- uh, demonstrated liar, but he's not lying about this. This is Brian Williams reporting on Donald Trump's bad poll numbers. And you know, how unfun would it be to be in the meeting where you explain to Donald Trump that he's failing and his numbers suck. Lit up tonight in blue for the workers of the MTA who keep the buses and rails moving through the mostly stay-at-home city of New York. Well, good evening once again. Yeah, to be to be fair, the opening it's a very mundane clip, but it's it just goes to show how upset he gets. Day 1196 of this Trump administration, 188 days now until our presidential election, and on this day, spoken out loud to reporters in the White House, the president said this, and we quote. This is going away. I think we're going to come up with vaccines and all, but this is going away. It's going to go. It's going to leave. It's going to be gone. It's going to be eradicated. (laughs) Indeed, the president's son-in-law, as you'll see here in just a moment today, called what we are living through a great success story. For that, today, his proud father-in-law called him a genius. Trump's effort to contain the growing toll on our nation comes as he also attempts to secure a second term in office. Tonight, the Washington Post has new reporting on the challenges for the president and on the impact of weeks of marathon briefings on the polls. The paper says recent internal polling shows him slipping behind Joe Biden in some key swing states and that he erupted during a call with his 2020 campaign manager after hearing that news, quote, At one point in that call, Trump said he might sue Brad Parscale. Trump told Parscale he did not believe the polling that had been presented to him, even though it came from the campaign and the RNC. NBC News now has confirmed Trump's blow up. The AP has new details on this story as well. We will. Threatening to sue Parcells. Oh, sue Parcells. Dude, he should sue Parcells. <laughs> Donald, Donald Trump, I mean, he's a TV guy. There's no way he's watching this, but I would just like to register that out into the Trump universe. It does sound like bullshit. He should sue that guy. <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. Um, I mean, you're paying somebody who, first of all, I don't know who this guy Parcell is. I don't know where he comes from. I know he did some social media for Trump in 2016, or at least packs related to Trump. And look, maybe he's a talented guy. Maybe who he's who Trump deserves as campaign manager, or maybe he's a know nothing loser who's profiting off of Donald Trump's name and now giving him bad poll advice. I don't know, yeah. but I'd certainly look into it and try to figure out what the hell is going on. It's like that scene in Spaceballs where he's like, I'm surrounded by assholes. Like, are you an <laughs> idiot? Wait, are you absolutely an incompetent moron? <laughs> I'm surrounded by incompetence. I'm surrounded by total incompetence. I mean, Actually, they're, no, the problem no. is they're competent and telling him what he doesn't want to hear. So. Right, right, exactly. It's kind of like, uh, it's just like, hey, look, I mean, we can, it's, it's one thing to agree 
that a pandemic isn't going to hit the United States. But at a certain point, we got to tell him that he's about to F up Michigan. <laughs> and of course, anytime Donald Trump throws a tantrum and it's reported on, then there is the response to the reporting. I'm not having a tantrum tantrum. Here is Donald Trump on Twitter. Lion Brian Williams of MSDNC. <laughs> There's always grains of truth. There's always grains of truth in what Trump says. I mean, he's got three truths in that. First. Okay, yeah, actually, this, this is starting with three objective truths. Lion Before Brian Williams of MSDNC. Check, There's check. two. <laughs> a Concast, boom, that's a big truth. <laughs> Concast scam company. I'm sure anybody that's used uh, that, that particular uh, outfit would agree and know exactly what Trump's talking about. Wouldn't know the truth if it was nailed to his wooden fork. <laughs> Remember? When he lied about his bravery in the helicopter? Totally made up story. He's a true dummy who was thrown off of network news like a dog. Like a dog. Yeah. <laughs> If you want a fun Trump uh, <laughs> search on Twitter, search for all of real Donald Trump's tweets that say like a dog, because it's some pretty good stuff there. Yeah, Jesus. if he puts in a like a dog, he's he means it. His dad must have said that. There must have been some like weird formative experience with his ultra weird, bizarre father who said that. There, that, that, that has to be deep in the Trump psyche somehow. Yeah, I like Donald like Trump calling dog. other people liars, too. <laughs> <laughs> you lied once. You remember that time you were busted lying? Never happened to me. <laughs> but he's like, again, it's that difference of all these people lie, but they have some, like, I, I you know, who, who even, I don't even know the extent that matters. I, I, I actually think it's very politically effective for Trump that because he is so uniquely mentally and emotionally damaged that he doesn't perceive his lies as lies. I think that helps him as a communicator, right. paradoxically, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, people are very used to, like, a modern set of liars and people who, you know, they spin and they talk around things. Yeah. And then Trump just came along and was just like, I didn't do that. Like, do you remember that clip? I can never get over that clip of the Libya one where he, he was on, I think, I don't know, one of the Sunday morning network shows. And he, it was one of the times where they, they first started to take him seriously. And that he was railing about Libya, which, you know, again, was a horrifying disaster. And then they play this clip. He's sitting there. They're like, you know, you're attacking the Obama administration every day about Libya, but what about this? And then they go, you know, the idiots in the Trump Tower in 2011. And he's just like, you know, I've met Gaddafi. Right. I've dealt with him. We got to go and it would be fantastic. And then they go back to him and he's just like, I mean, we've talked about this a million times. His response was essentially, well, in my version, everything went great. It didn't grow great. So obviously that wasn't what I was proposing. Yeah. I feel like he'd be good at a polygraph because where people, when they're lying, they're yes. so focused on the truth. He's just already moved on to what the lie gets him. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, it's a, it's like uh circumstances precede essence. Okay. Um, let me, uh, let's, let's uh, take a little break. We can Real do quick. not have really the capability to do that. So we kind of just have to bring Kurt on. Oh, we're going to bring Kurt on. Oh, okay. Sorry. About that. So uh, uh, yeah, Brendan, uh, if he's ready, I can admit him now. You know, I'll just do that. That sound good. Yeah, he's ready. Okay, cool. All right. I'm going to dip out. Okay. Yeah. We, we lost our smooth transition period. We lost our smooth transition period. Oh, it's, it's we'll get it back. Yeah. This is a smooth transition period. Joining us now is a journalist, a writer, uh, covering Mexican politics and the presidency of AMLO, Kurt Hackbarth. Kurt, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, Kurt, we're going to get into speci the specifics around uh, Corona and what's happening <clears throat> now sure. with AMLO. But uh, I want to start with a piece that you wrote uh uh, also recently, but it's called They Got Filthy Rich. This is in Jacobin. They got right. filthy rich off of cocaine trafficking and killed leftists. Now AMLO must make them pay. And this, and this really is important because it gets into 
you know, the actual political contours of the drug war in Mexico, the U.S. role in it, the, how the violence has escalated so pre uh, precipitously going back to uh, the, the, the Calderon era. But what specifically, I mean, how is, first of all, explain that kind of big picture and then how it relates to the political targeting of AMLO a little over a year into his presidency. Yeah, so um, we got to go back a little bit in, in history. In 2006, there was a very contested um, presidential election um, yep. with Felipe Calderon and AMLO running his first race. Um, the official results showed Calderon winning by a fraction, a half of a percentage point, and AMLO claimed there was fraud with good reason. So Calderon, um, when he took office, in a sense to kind of cement himself uh, in power, launched this drug war in December of 2006, uh, in large part along the Colombian model. Right? Um, and this has lasted through the Calderon administration and through the Peña Nieto administration, uh, and has caused the deaths of some over 200,000 um, Mexicans. Uh, caught up uh, in this drug war in, in, in some way or, or another. Right? Um, AMLO in his third run in 2018 ran on the promise of ending this, finally, this 12 year uh, reign of bloodshed. Um, a lot of it with US weapons, it has to be pointed out. 70% of the weapons used in the Mexican drug war flow across the border uh, from the United States freely. Um, and AMLO has struggled with this in his first year, um, because as we're now discovering, and it was suspected at the time, um, the Calderon administration was, um, was infiltrated at its highest levels. Uh, right now, Calderon's former security chief, who I talked about in that article, Genaro Garcia Luna, is awaiting trial in New York City on, on uh, charges of having colluded um, with the Sinaloa cartel. So we're at the prospect of cabinet members in the Calderon administration having been in collusion with the Sinaloa cartel the whole time that they were trying to sell this idea of a drug war um, to the Mexican public and the international public. Um, and it also became um, a means to, to suppress social movements and workers' movements and other things. <laughs> yeah, I want you to keep elaborating on that because that Columbia example is perfect, right? Because you have, and you know, it's, it's the model. And, and also I wanna at least bring in just to mention uh, Venezuela, I mean, you know, Colombia is still a kind of main source of, of, of trafficking in Mexico uh, as well in a different way in Latin America. There's very little to no evidence. And a lot of people have actually countered the administration's claims of some type of a large overarching Venezuela role in narco trafficking. And clearly it's a tool for the pre-existing effort of attempting, uh, you know, a, a coup. In right. Venezuela. So in Colombia, going back to the 80s and 90s, and you see elements of this in the show like Narcos, although some of it isn't kind of teased out, but you have a US backed sort of turning of the drug war into a war. This was like on steroids in Mexico during the Calderon era. Right. Then you have the element and, you know, of different administrations sort of like you, you talked about the connections potentially with the Sinaloa cartel. There's some reporting of the DEA um, and yep. other agencies playing yep. kind of similar roles, uh, you know, similar double games like that. And so you, you know, and, and again, just to parallel it with Colombia, you did have that dynamic for several years where at the bare minimum, it's like just not contestable that Colombian and, and US uh, forces were at the very least allowing the Cali cartel to do this right. like ultra dirty war against Pablo Escobar. Obviously Escobar was extraordinarily dirty too, but the point being that there was at the very least informal collaboration with what would become the world's biggest drug cartel. So is that all, that's, is that all basically getting replayed over the last several years in Mexico? And did AMLO specifically say that in addition to social justice and you know in, to social democratic reforms that he would actually change that dynamic both in terms of US foreign policy and uh, Mexican internal interests? They've talked in specific terms about what's called the Colombianization uh, of Mexico. And um, shortly after Calderon took power, uh, the Merida plan 
took effect with the United States and Mexico. And this was a whole plan for what's called security cooperation um, and all kinds of other cooperation in this. So I think the answer is, is, is clearly yes. Um, I think something else that's not to be overlooked here is that this was at the exact same time, uh, a period when Mexico was, was desperately trying to privatize uh, its oil uh, company, Pemex, which right. tried to do, and uh, the following president, uh, Peña Nieto, succeeded in doing at least in part. So I think we another thing to look at is this connection between drug wars, in quotes, and opening up countries for exploitation of minerals and natural resources. And that we saw in Colombia and that we're seeing uh, again uh, in Mexico. Now, um, AMLO did run very specifically on a pledge to stop the violence. That was a very clear part of his, of his program uh, in 2018 of bringing this to an end. Now, it's been a real challenge and the, the levels of violence have continued, to be honest. Um, he's set up a, what's called the National Guard, which is a militarized uh, police force, which is a new militarized police force in an attempt to um, combat the corruption and the infiltration of existing forces. The problem is it continues to be under military control with all of that, with all that implies with regards to uh, potentials for violations of human rights, um, you know, uh, being beyond the reach of civilian courts and a lot of other things. Uh, when Donald Trump um, threatened tariffs against Mexico, um, AMLO then readily dispatched a lot of these troops from the National Guard down to the border of Colombia. And it's now being used more um, to try to stop the flow of immigrants. Right, right. So in this last uh, year, just how, how is, you know, roughly speaking, I think, you know, it's a challenge, but there has been some real achievements. And also, I think even just like in the, in the kind of U.S. mainstream press, mm -hmm. we see some of the same sorts of, you know, writings that you see about AVO before the coup there. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the sort of domestic elite related to the kind of international financial system. So, I mean, basically, big picture before Corona, we'll get to Corona in a minute. Sure. How has AMLO done, relatively speaking, and then how has the backlash been? In terms of the violence? Um... Well, uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, concern with, you know, uh, like basically people trying, uh, people inside Mexico being interested in dislodging him, uh, resistance yeah. <laughs> from U.S. Uh, policymakers. Um, what you know? How has he done, and and what is the what are the reviews in so far? Basically, he's done, I think, pretty well. Yeah, um, he's done pretty well over his first year and and just about a half. And you know, as you mentioned, with a lot um, against him. You know, the famous quote is Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States, right? Yeah. The classic old uh, quote. Um, he has instituted a series of, of social programs in order to try to mitigate the violence. And that includes uh, scholarships for young people to stay in school. That includes uh, the country's first ever national pension program, uh, disability pension, uh, he's working towards a form of national health insurance. Um, that on the social side. He also has a series of big ticket infrastructure uh, projects which have been more controversial. Um, but the Maya train in the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, which would be a tourist train connecting up um, the tourist sites of the Yucatan, which has been heavily criticized rightly, I think by indigenous uh, groups. He wants to build a new refinery on the Atlantic uh, coast in order to make Mexico energy sufficient and not depend on American refineries to uh, refine America's uh, oil. Um, and with regards um, to, I think, the most important thing, he's really attacked Mexicans, the Mexican um, cu culture of corruption that had grown up over the last two administrations. And that has been huge. Um, it was really underreported in the American press how corrupt, for example, the Peña Nieto administration was. Right. 
If Peña Nieto had been the president of Venezuela, it would have been front page news every day. But we're talking about certainly the most corrupt administration in Latin America. Uh, right now, uh, Peña Nieto's uh, former head of the oil company Pemex, Emilio Lasoya, is in jail in Spain awaiting extradition uh, to Mexico on charges of um, illegal financing of his 2012 presidential campaign. Um, Peña Nieto's uh, head of social development, Rosario Robles, uh, is in jail here on charges of funneling hundreds of millions of dollars um, through public entities into private corporations. Um, there's no end to what we could talk about with regards to the corruption in previous administrations. And, uh, and AMLO has been uh, attacking that on several fronts. What about the charges that it was sort of lazily thrown around, at least in my view, that he's, some, that he's autocratic? Now, Again, it's not that the guy is above reproach or there aren't legitimate right. questions or right. critiques that emerge from indigenous communities or social movements or, or anybody, if it's legitimate. Sure. But, uh, you know, again, um, guy's democratically elected. He has high approval ratings. I mean, where, where does the notion of him being autocratic come from? And is there any validity to it or none? I think it's lazy reporting. Um, <clears throat> Uh, AMLO is, um, is a progressive populist, and there's this idea from the kind of neoliberal press that anybody who's a populist is an autocrat. Right. Distinguishing between right-wing populism and left uh, populism. Um, let's just look where we came from. You know, in the, in the Calderon administration, Garcia Luna, who we mentioned, was openly threatening journalists, actually sending out death threats to journalists who were investigating him. Yep. Um, in the Peña Nieto administration, Carmen Aristegui, who was one of Mexico's um, most popular journalists, reported on a corruption scandal involving Peña Nieto's wife, who had a huge luxury house built for her by a favored contractor, and she was thrown off the radio. She had a popular radio program that was ended. So to call AMLO an autocrat in the light of the administrations that came before him is laughable. Right. The freedom of the press in Mexico in the AMLO administration has been more than it's been for generations. Yeah. Now, AMLO <clears throat> criticizes the press, and I think they're not above, you know, as we saw, as we've seen in their so-called reporting of the COVID pandemic, they're not above criticism. But I think that's where some of the, you know, they see AMLO criticizing the press in his morning press conference, and they say, aha, there's an autocrat who's, you know, trying to take down the press the way Trump does. And it's really a very, very, very lazy comparison. Well, we saw that here. I mean, this ludicrous notion of comparing Bernie Sanders' criticism right. of corporate <clears throat> monopolies. And like, mm -hmm. hey, right. you know, maybe Jeff Bezos has a self-interest in not covering the inequality crisis. Exactly. Or maybe there's an incentive structure. Oh, well, that's absolutely the same thing <laughs> as, you know, Donald Trump, like, uh, you know, talking shit about the New York Times or whining about Acosta or whatever. So it's, yeah, it sounds like very much a similar dynamic with maybe even more dangerous potential implications. So I want to get overall how uh, AMLO has covered Corona as, as has ha his policy on COVID and then how the press has covered it. But I want to just start with a comparison. And I, it seems to me that as far as I understand, AMLO has maybe rolled things out like shutdowns more slowly, but he has not adopted a Swedish approach of we're actually going to do something really different. We're going to experiment essentially with not having a lockdown. And it was, and I think people were very interested in whether Sweden could be successful or not, because mm -hmm. none of us want to be in a long-term lockdown. Long -term. Now the numbers seem to be very clear that Sweden has not been successful. Um, and obviously they're taking this risk even, and, and it's not working out and they have, you know, some of the best healthcare and social infrastructure in the world. So, you right. know, it's less dangerous for them to experiment with this than America or Mexico for that matter. But that being said, if AMLO rolling things out more slowly, which is sort of my understanding of what he's done and correct me if I'm wrong, is... A global catastrophe and another sign of his anti-scientific autocratic whatever. But then Sweden actually has a very clear policy basically contradicting right. the global consensus. 
that's interesting and innovative policy from you know one of the smartest countries in the world. Can we just start, go anywhere you want, but I just think that contrast is very illustrative with I, know, press I, bias and assumptions. I absolutely agree. And it, it speaks volumes to the bias towards European and so-called first world countries in this. That Sweden, if Mexico were to do something remotely like what Sweden did, could you imagine, you know, how how they'd be, you know, pilloried um, by by you know national and international press interests that would just use that as a club to beat um, those progressive uh, experiment. Um, and we saw this in this recent Financial Times editorial that I mentioned in my uh, recent piece. You know, the Financial Times, from the country of Boris Johnson and herd mentality. Is there on its podium lecturing Mexico on its coronavirus response? I mean, please. Uh, with regards to AMLO's uh, response, I think it's been, in, in the whole, fairly good. Um, the virus was a little bit slower to get here. It was a little bit slower than, than the US and certainly uh, Italy, Spain, uh, Western Europe. And um, Mexico was actually relatively ahead of the curve in closing main things. It was ahead of the curve, certainly compared to <clears throat> Italy and Spain and others in closing schools, um, in closing non-essential federal government uh, functions. Where AMLO was a little bit slow was in his own um, holding rallies. He was still out there with the people, um, somewhat beyond what would have been uh, recommendable. And we can discuss why that, why that was too. But in the main, the closings happened ahead of, ahead of time. So um, then, yeah, so then how is this, I mean, uh, if you want to, you can explain why he's still out, you know, why he was out rallying later, but also, you know, more broadly, what, give us some real examples. There's a Financial Times editorial, there's some incredible examples from the Mexican press. Yeah. Uh, you know, how, relative to what's happened, We'll get into the details of how this has been misreported. Well, <clears throat> this has everything to do with the structure of the Mexican uh, press, which is, you know, an oligarchic press system with two main television stations, Televisa and TV Azteca, and a series of, you know, uh, newspapers owned by wealthy people with their own with their own interests. So, sound familiar, right? Um, <clears throat> During previous administrations, the press was semi-controlled through massive spending in government publicity. The government would spend millions of pesos in government publicity, you know, to put advertisements and such in newspapers um, and to commercials on television stations, but it became a way to funnel millions and millions and millions of pesos of government publicity into the coffers of the television stations and the newspapers. That was called the chayote in Mexican Spanish. Um, that kept the press on side. They were, you know, indirectly bought off the mainstream uh, press. And then even a, a lot of these um, pundits and anchors would have their own like private press companies or websites, which would also get more government publicity and even more, you know, um, enrich their coffers. AMLO comes into power and he drastically cuts the budget for government publicity. Mm -hmm. They're not getting the subsidy they used to get. Um, that's one thing. And the second thing is, you know, this, it's, it's a pundit class of conservative, wealthy, you know, columnists and, and uh, TV presenters who are in absolute no contact with, you know, with the Mexican public and cannot understand why AMLO continues to be popular, um, you know, with 60 and 70% approval ratings, you know, in the face of what to them is clearly a disaster, right, in their own, in their own Mexico City bubble. It's just an absolute disaster and how can people not see it the way they, they do? Now it's one thing for them to have their opinions, but it's another for them to then take the next step and report fake news. And they've been doing throughout this COVID crisis. And I mentioned a few examples in the piece. Um, you had kind of the former premier anchor in Mexican television uh, tweeting out the news that um, this Jose Curi had died, uh, this magnate. Um, you have people uh, tweeting out news that Mexico is about to 
um, enter into a phase three tomorrow, severe uh, level three pandemic response. You have people tweeting out even stuff I didn't mention in the article that the government was buying pirated medicines, uh, that private labs were not being allowed to, get, to do testing. Um, the list goes on and on and on. And you have these high paid pundits with no scruples whatsoever participating um, to the point of ridiculousness in this fake news barrage that's been going on. And you also, let's talk about, can you talk substantively about the social bailout? Because that is, I mean, certainly the most important thing from a human well-being perspective outside of the, the pandemic itself. Um, sure. Talk about what AMLO has actually done and then talk about the irony of the Financial Times. Now, I will say the Financial Times definitely is on the sort of side of, uh, of the financial press of, hey, let's give the peasants a little bit like we don't want to completely have social disruption. So I mm -hmm. will say that, you know, Martin Wolf for a decade during after the recession was writing and talking about the need to deal with some income inequality. And then, you know, of course, they sat down and destroyed Corbyn when that actually became something viable on the table. A in the UK, yeah. A real thing. So that being said, the incredible irony of the Financial Times attacking a progressive populist in a developing country for not having a big enough social bailout. Yeah, I mean, what do you say about that? You know, <laughs> and you've got Moody's and Fitch and Standard and Poor's uh, lowering Mexico's bond rating, you know, taking advantage of COVID to slap down Mexico's bond rating for its sovereign debt and for Pemex, its oil company's debt, which makes it um, more expensive to borrow. And then on the other hand, they're saying, why isn't he borrowing more? Why isn't he doing stimulus? You know? And if he were to do that, then they'd be criticizing him for being a classic overspending Latin American, you know, um, left just throwing money at problems. So you really can't keep up with how they're, how they're criticizing him uh, on this. And I think there's another point to make that's important. Uh, Mexico has a revolving line of credit with the IMF which AMLO has not wanted to use, I think for very legitimate reasons. Once you start getting in debt with the IMF, the IMF then starts dictating to you the, what they want you to do uh, to, in order to pay them back. And usually that means raising taxes on the poor, such as gasoline taxes or sales taxes, which in Mexico is the value added tax. It's happening now in El Salvador, which, which got an IMF loan, and the IMF is right there saying, all right, you guys have got to start doing this, this, and this for fiscal year 2022. Um, that said, I think AMLO could be doing more. Um, he's been very macroeconomically, he's been very macroeconomically orthodox. Yep. But I think we have to understand that Mexico is not in a position like the United States. It's not the same case. You know, if Mexico deviates, its, uh, its currency is at risk, um, you know, investors flee the country, um, oil prices have tanked. He's got to be, he's got to be careful with what he does. Right. You know? Right. And um, I think sometimes that's not, that's not taken sufficiently into, into, into account, the, his, move, his room for maneuver. One thing I would criticize Amlo on is that he's refused to raise taxes on the wealthy, which is what needs to happen right. or later. Uh, Mexico's wealthy get, get away with murder. They pay very little taxes. Um, there's all kinds of loopholes in the tax code. Uh, the capital gains on stocks is 10%, which is a joke. Um, you know, Mexico is a factory of millions of poor and a handful of some of the richest people in the world. Why has he not wanted to do that? What is his calculus in terms of his, and, and maybe, you know what, can we just talk about the, I think the two kind of clear areas where there's sort of like, okay, let, there's areas that AMLO deserves a lot more credit than he's getting. And you can see all of the institutional and, and, and international bias against him because yeah. he is even, you know, even a, I mean, look, you know, we've I've covered Brazil a lot. I mean, Lula was an extraordinarily conciliatory, strategic leader. He still becomes a victim of a U.S. foreign policy process. Right. So I you know, there is the idea of anybody in in Latin America with an even modest social democratic agenda is going to get run afoul of of 
U.S. press and other aspects of U.S. foreign policy uh, apparatus. Then there's, okay, maybe we genuinely, you know, have a disagreement um, or, you know, want to kind of focus on, on different perspectives on something like, you know, a development project that implicates different types of ecology or First Nations people or whatever. That's important. That's a, that's a worthy debate. And then where are the areas where, you know, we would like to see him raise taxes on the wealthy. We'd like to see him um, really be a counterforce to the Trump administration's just vicious, barbarous treatment of migrants and asylum seekers. But in terms of his actual political capital, both domestically and internationally, in addition to everything else he's taken on, what is the real room he has? And I guess specifically on those two issues to first raise taxes on the wealthy and secondly, try to counter the Trump administration on, on migration. Cause it just seems to me from what I followed and obviously, you know, infinitely mm -hmm. more to me, those are the areas where it's like, okay, the, the criticism makes sense, of course, but you know, okay. You know, the guy's in a superhero. What's the mm -hmm. context for him to be able to make those moves? Yeah. I think that's a great question. Uh, with regards to the tax issue, he ran in 2018, his, you know, his, his third campaign, on a no new tax pledge. So he, he dug himself in a hole right there. Um, and has tried to keep national elites on side. He's announced an infrastructure project, which includes the building of 100 new universities, uh, roads, um, you know, bridges, a whole national infrastructure program besides these, a new uh, airport in Mexico City, the refinery we mentioned. Um, and using those contracts to benefit the national elite instead of the international uh, elite, kind of along the lines of a Lula. Yeah. Which seemed to, you know, satisfy, you know, Mexico's voracious um, uh, corporate class. But then you saw with COVID that they're willing to turn on a dime, you know, when it's, when it's convenient to them, which is always the problem when you try to stroke the backs uh, of a corporate elite, um, you know, through, through, through contracts and such. Um, with regards to countering the US, I think there's also room for criticism for AMLO on that. He's been very conciliatory uh, with Trump um, to a fault. He succeeded in having the tariff threat wiped out, at least for now. Um, but that's also come at the price of his using the National Guard to crack down on, on migrants. A lot of them coming through Central American countries that, as we know, have been destabilized historically by the U.S. You know, right. which is a whole other, which is a whole other story. And today, too. I mean, just yeah. to be clear, and it's yeah. happening. Right, right. And and he's even allowed um, Mex asylum seekers in the U.S. to be temporarily housed in Mexico while waiting their asylum cases. Um, Mexico has refused to become what's called a safe third nation like Canada, which would require asylum seekers to seek asylum in Mexico before they could seek asylum in the US. He's refused that to his credit, but he's been overly conciliatory. What's his room for maneuver with the United States? I think there's somewhat more than he's used in both cases. Um, and, I, and I say that hopefully with an, with an understanding of what's against him. But I think there's somewhat more, he has somewhat more leeway than he's used. He's got a 70% approval rating. He's got majorities in both houses uh, of Congress. Um, there's a lot of people who, you know, who have been involved in social movements um, for decades and all of those flowed into the election of 2018 where they finally overcame a system of fraud and a system of uh, many other obstacles. So I think there is more room for maneuver than, than he's done. And I, and I try to say that without being judgmental because I, you know, I know what he's up against. Yeah, I mean, and not least of which the, the threats from the North, which I mean, right. you know, it, it just strikes me that if you already see the press drumbeat against him and it really does echo you know, I think of, of Evo, Evo a lot because it is the most recent coup. And then, you know, drawing parallels with other leaders who, you know, again, I, I, 
I, I think Lula is the best president of the 21st century. So I have no undercutting of him. I think he did incredible things for the Brazilian people and he's a great statesman. But, you know, again, was not somebody, somebody who was understood his role as a president. And that means yeah. obviously you have to work with everybody and, you know, you're not a commentator. It's a different job. Um, but, you know, so he still ran afoul of U.S. foreign policy, I think specifically just with, you know, not privatizing strategic resources in Brazil. And so, you know, it, as, a, as we follow this, it just seems to me with AMLO that we, we got to be so careful. I mean, you know way more than me, uh, and I'm sure you're right in terms of his approval rating, but man, that, that room for maneuver can, can turn back and hit you in the face really quickly. It can. Yeah. And let's, let's remember that, um, you know, one of the first foreign policy challenges AMLO had to face when taking office was refusing to recognize Juan Guaido as president of Venezuela. Right. He stuck his neck right out on that, barely months into office, and right. said, not recognizing a U.S. puppet. He didn't say U.S. puppet, but he said, you know, uh, we're not recognizing uh, Guaido. And even went down to the Organization of American States, and Mexico was practically alone uh, in this. Uh, then in the Bolivian coup, AMLO sent a plane to get Evo the hell out of there. Yeah to Mexico and potentially saved his life. Yes. The time when he was being hunted down. Yep. So, you know, Mexico under AMLO is regaining a degree of its leadership role in Latin America. A generation of neoliberal, very subservient governments to the U.S. had frittered away. And both well, of them were expenses of, of political capital. <clears throat> Absolutely. So what should we keep in mind as we follow AMLO and, and get a kind of proper sense of his performance um, out of COVID and everything else that it isn't this big disaster that's being spun uh, in most no, of the it's press? Not. No, it's not. Um, <clears throat> the right was hoping that with its fake news barrage and it's all out offensive, it could use the COVID um, pandemic uh, as a means to weaken AMLO ahead of the congressional elections coming up next year, or in the best of cases, dislodge him, dislodge him from power. Uh, and the Financial Times even said, well, they should start taking legal action against AMLO's, um, AMLO's measures. I mean, what the hell is the Financial Times, you know, what? saying shit like that? You know? All right, all right. Um, and, the, and the right has failed to do that. Um, the, the right-wing parties are in absolute disarray. Uh, Felipe Calderon basically ruined the PAN, the, 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 the party he was elected on, and is actually trying to start a new party. Um, Enrique Peña Nieto basically ruined the PRI, uh, the party he was elected on. So it's interesting to see that a lot of the opposition to AMLO is coming outside of the sphere of parties because right. the, and the PRI are so discredited because of their recent administrations. So you see that both their business groups, they're, you know, bots paid for by Calderon. They're a whole set shadowy series of dark money paying a lot of internet campaigns um, <clears throat> and kind of chamber of commerce kind of uh, crusades against um, AMLO. The reality is that cases of COVID in Mexico have not been exaggerated. Um, it has not been, the, the, the health system has not broken down. It's not been like Quito where you saw people, you know, bodies out in the streets. Right. That has not, that has not happened. Despite, you know, um, hysterical predictions that that was just about to happen. Now the curve is going up in Mexico now. This is, these will be the critical two weeks in seeing where this goes. Right. But, you know, the next two weeks will tell, but AMLO has uh, worked at a deal where private hospitals have to pick up, you have to use 50, his paying private hospitals have to use 50% of their available beds to treat COVID patients. Um, you know, the, the public system, you know, which has been devastated by years of neoliberal governments is holding up. Um, the public is, you know, mainly respecting uh, the quarantine. It's not an obligatory lockdown. But it's, you know, a government, you know, with a lot of government pushing um, a quarantine. And that's going to stay on through the mid-May in some places and through the end of May. Um, and so the largely, the large, you know, the 
large predicted disaster has not has not occurred that uh, the, the press has been has been whipping up and almost opponents are furious because you know they were happy to have people die if that meant that they could you know you know bludgeon the government with that <clears throat> right well, Kurt Hackbarth, really appreciate it. Everybody read Kurt's reporting on AMLO uh, and contemporary Mexican politics and U.S. foreign policy in Jacobin. Uh, I believe you're actually, you're working on a book about the 2018 election, right? Yeah, we're actually working on a project with Verso on AMLO's first two years. So. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, very important leader and, and place to follow right now. And, uh, and, and in some ways, you know, uh, an, an, an area of hope in a yeah. very bleak international politics at the moment. Um, Kurt Hackworth, stay safe. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. All right, folks. Um, Matt and uh, Brandon, you guys there? Yep. Hey, so we're still doing the uh, break before the, the fun half, correct? Yeah, uh, I'm going to play MR Fun, but we'll bring Jamie in here for uh, plugs and we can do that fun stuff. Okay. Uh, well, let me just start by saying become a member of the Majority Report, majority.fm slash become a member. Also, um, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet. Uh, I will say, um, I think actually the first orders are... I, I know at least that people are telling me that orders in my book are sold out, which is awesome, um, which I'm loving, but I would still go try to get thank a copy. Thank you, George against, Soros. Thank you very much, George Soros. <laughs> George Soros summoned me to his death chamber where he was taking blood from a young blood donor. And he said, please, more Dave Rubin material. Yeah. Um, actually, there isn't very much Dave Rubin material. Uh, it's uh, particularly, I would say, the conclusion of the book on the African National Congress and cosmopolitan socialism. That there is a bigger project and argument there, which I'm really excited about. So check it out against the web. Uh, cosmopolitan answers the new right. On Tuesday's Michael Brooks show, we had on uh, Yolian Agbu, and she is an organizer with the May 1st strikes that are happening tomorrow, and some really great coordination between students and labor organizing with that. We're going to talk about, about that in the fun half. That's a very important effort to support. And we also um, had a really fun time with Judah Friedlander. Uh, tonight, we're going to do a stream on Teamster organizing at five o'clock. It's going to be available for, for everybody. And the Union Moment in COVID. And then on next Tuesday, we're having Torrey Reed. There's an amazing book called Towards Freedom. Uh, and uh, Doris Apollo of Telesor to talk about U.S. foreign policy in the Caribbean during Corona. Patreon.com slash TMBS is how you get the whole thing. And check out, I'm still still very stoked about the Cornell West interview. So, oh, yeah. uh, and of course, subscribe to the Michael Brooks Show on YouTube and uh, check out TMBS.FM and whole bunch of new uh we can't do live shows obviously right now which really sucks i super miss them can't wait till we can do them again but we're working on a series of tmbs guides so that's going to be some uh some new projects so lots cooking in tmbs land matt what's going on at literary hangover uh what's going on now is everyone that is has a twitch account is subscribing to twitch.tv slash literary hangover uh basically what i've been doing is doing these study halls where I'll play a video game like A Plague's Tale Innocence while I listen to Michel Foucault talk about uh, plague towns and uh, the surveillance state and things like that. Uh, and actually tonight, I think I'm going to be playing Half-Life 2 while listening to 1984, uh, to very appropriate, very appropriate matchup to anybody familiar with both of those. So yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to grow right now. Just uh, zoomed past 600 followers. So uh, twitch.tv slash literary hangover subscribe now folks that is awesome jamie you're here yeah I'm... you're also quiet but you do have you're a mic quiet. stand this time can you hello hear me? hold on can you hear me? Uh, we can but your mic is a little bit low it's low How about oh there now? we go that's better there you go that's better, better. Yep. yeah right. go excellent excellent so this week on the antifada i knew i know i said we were doing a bernie post-mortem but that was postponed. Um, yesterday, we ran an episode about the US and China. 
and their political economy and how they became intertwined. Um, it is the first of a two-part series on China. So if you're interested in China and what's going on over there, check it out. Um, this weekend, we're recording an episode with Assad Hader on depoliticization. That will serve as our Bernie postmortem. I think um, think it's going to be pretty good. And also, I got the date wrong last time. I'm going to put a link to it in the episode description. But Andy and I will be appearing at the virtual version of Red May Seattle on May 7th, talking about coronavirus and the future of work with uh, three very smart people whose names I don't want to screw up. There they are. Magali Miranda, Aaron Bananov, and Annie McClanahan. So I will be sure to put a link for anyone who wants to check it out. Sweet. All right. I guess, guys, we are going to take, we're going to take the uh, MR Fun Half song break. Yep. Matt, is that correct? Correct. Here All right. Go. And uh, we will see you on the Fun Half. is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. Do. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue if you don't like me. Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. I can only imagine what Walter Block is uh, thinking and saying during Corona. It's, it's good uh, every time, that song. It always works. I don't want to look up what he's saying. I don't actually want to know. I just imagine it would be pretty funny. There are no atheists in a foxhole, and there are no libertarians in a pandemic. What's Walter Block? Uh, I gotta give uh, Walter Block credit. I, I would... I don't know about that i can imagine if there's some type of like there should be a global scheme where people can sell air to each other 
Okay, he's still. Oh, I got a 500 in internal server error on his website. Hmm. Oh, so. all right. So he might be. Uh, but he's still like posting things. Apparently, he's still and posting. I, Walter Block and William Barnett on problems with the Hayekian triangle. Oh Jesus! <laughs> all right, I don't. Yeah, please. Something I do not want to know about. All right, let's uh, talk about this for a few minutes. This is really important. It's something um, that uh, this is one of those things that's very easy to participate in, but if it goes to scale, it will be significant. I'm going to quote now from The Hill. Workers from corporations are playing a walkout on Friday, including employees from Amazon, Walmart, and FedEx. The workers are seeking better health and safety standards as well as having, as well as hazard pay while working during the corona pandemic. Former Amazon employee Christian Small shared a flyer on Twitter last week that included other prominent company names participating in the demonstration on May 1, such as Instacart, Target, and Whole Foods. Of course, Whole Foods is owned by Amazon. The Friday demonstrations will also request protective cleaning equipment and full disclosure on the number of infected cases in company facilities. The protests would result in employees of the listed companies calling in sick from work or stepping out during their lunch break. At the same time, some union members will reportedly join workers outside of warehouses and storefront in support of strikes. And you could see there's actually images of different um, strikes that of course definitely don't get the attention that the Reon, Reopen America uh, strikes get or Reopen America protests get. Uh, but there's, there is ways that if you don't get too many people um, at these things that people are actually maintaining social distance but being physically present which i you know i would not advocate obviously from my position anybody do uh but at the same time you can't underestimate that physical presence with people doing it safely is in fact quite significant so for people who are putting that on the line in these unions i really want to acknowledge that because you know and also at the same time say that you know you're stepping out of a job with a company that is willing to kill you on a daily basis anyway. Um, so it's, it's brave and it's significant. Now we can talk and we should talk about the bigger implications of some of the revival and labor that's happening right now and the wildcat strikes and new people like Christian Smalls, who, you know, I had the pleasure of interviewing, who's gotten some traction as a very brave and very effective organizer. Um, what does that mean for long-term demands? What does that mean for creating a social infrastructure in the United States? As of now, um, we are in such a predatory phase of how we do uh, capitalism in this country that these are demands that anyone with any kind of I don't want to say base decency. I mean, I want to say with a society, a developed country that had any labor power, these things would have already been taken care of, right? Because Amazon and Target are not going to take care of people out of the kindness of their heart, obviously. That's just a margin. Uh, but, you know, a company, a, a German automaker doesn't take care of labor out of the product, out of the goodness of its heart. It, it, it takes care of it because labor has enough power still that they're actually part of coordinating company policy. So I want to put, I mean, there is the moral dimension to this on some level, of course. And obviously, you know, you can pick an extraordinary scumbag like a Jeff Bezos. But the bigger picture here is that if you don't have a countervailing power of labor, then companies will do what they want. And it is just a cost benefit analysis. And, that, and this is something that really, I mean, if you could just read Marx for the singular reason of understanding that power dynamic, that would be sufficient. I don't even care where your politics go. And a lot of people who actually had, I will say for the centrists out there, the previous generation of centrists who were able to actually win, particularly in the UK, a lot of them had read this stuff, took it in a totally different political and policy set direction, which you're free to do, but they at least understood how power worked on some level. And, uh, and I think that's just very important. So I want everybody to jump in, but please, in this case, it's a bare minimum if you're in quarantine, don't order anything from any of these companies during that day. And I'd certainly say, um, 
as much as I don't want to exaggerate the significance of individual consumer decisions, I, I've been talking with people who have been finding ways to basically not use Amazon anymore. And even regardless of the very important political and economic consequences, if that was scaled, uh, it makes their life more interesting <laughs> because it's more engaging and more dynamic to operate outside of an all-consuming bureaucracy. Yeah, I think if you're able to maintain your consumer power through this period, you should find some other place to, or like I've been ordering computer parts from specific, like, and you know, who knows how great those are too. Like, um, I forget, Newegg, I don't know. Hopefully Newegg's good, I don't know, but it's not Amazon, right? right. So. I mean, I will admit to using Amazon. I don't feel good about it but they make it the easiest option. Like they were successful at that. And, uh, but don't, definitely don't do it on May 1st. Don't be a scab. If you need stuff, plan ahead. Um, it, it's so important what's happening right now. I mean, we are seeing right now um, David Graeber's uh, bullshit jobs thesis being carried out in that we are seeing which jobs are essential and which jobs are not. Um, he all, and, and it turns out the essential jobs are often what he calls shit jobs, pardon my French, not my term, but they're shit jobs because you don't get paid enough to do them and you often uh, don't have labor rights, you don't have a union, but there's nothing bullshit inherently about these jobs. Like they're actually really important jobs and in a better world, um, you would be compensated for them on the level that you are contributing to society. So it, it's really, it's so important to see people uh, recognizing their power as workers and as a class. And given that these corporations are global ones, I hope that we, and I wouldn't be surprised if we started to see some kind of international solidarity from workers who work all around the world for these companies. And we should just spell out the media angle of it, too, where you're talking about why the uh, reopened protests get attention and these ones don't. It's because those ones uh, are a lot more boss friendly and our media exists to like basically tell bosses what they want to hear. That's exactly right. Now, that, by the way, that does not contradict for people who for people who get ultra linear about points. It's right. really helpful to remind yourself that you can note several aspects of a situation at once. So with the reopen protests, there is absolutely an astroturf dimension. It absolutely is a pro boss dimension uh, agenda, and it absolutely draws some very extreme right wing forces, which suck. And it absolutely is also in a context where there is not a social infrastructure going to appeal to people right. who feel correctly that they need to get back to work because they're not being provided for. All, see how I just listed those three things out? That's, I mean, again, this is actually another thing that's good about, uh, about reading Hegel and Marx, frankly, is dialectics are good. L life is not linear. There is dynamic interplays between things that produce contradiction and synthesis. And this yeah. isn't even, I mean, honestly, uh, indulge me for a second. In Mahayana Buddhism, emptiness is form, form is emptiness. That's a dialectic. Like this is a, this is a, it is a helpful, it is a, particularly in a world, and this gets a little cliche, but we are living in some pretty complicated times. You're going to need to be able to, to track multiple truths at once. Right. So, and also never blame the propagandized individuals in the hellscape such as we're living in, frankly. Well, that's also just, that's, that's something you don't even need to, uh, to complexify. That's right. It's always, you know, if you want to focus on that aspect, focus on the DeVos family. Right. So uh, what would be the synthesis of uh, right-wing AstroTurf protesters and uh, working class people who just want to go back to work so they have money? What do you mean? You said there's a synthesis involved. Oh, there's contradiction and synthesis across everything. Yeah. So what's the synthesis? I don't. I don't understand what you're saying. In dialectics, right? There uh -huh. are like one force doing this thing and one force doing this thing, and they come together right. and they create a synthesis. Just curious right. what you think that is here. Oh, you want to go to the fascism synthesis? Oh boy. <laughs> 
it's definitely i mean i think that's I mean, that's, that's the synthesis that we've been playing out for a little while i'd rather not go to there but uh i get what you're saying i mean there's also exploiting a contradiction inside that group by appealing to the working class component of it and not hectoring and blaming them yeah and keeping an my, eye on my point and keeping an eye on the fundamental contradiction, which is that fascism serves bosses. And right. It's never not going to serve. Absolutely. There is. Right. That's true. Fasc it, it's a cross-class alliance that is never good when that happens. Yeah. On the other hand, I want to also, you know, as important as I think these are, I think that we also need to look at the, that basically and many economists have pointed this out, that the Fed and the federal government operate as almost like a slush fund uh, yeah. for the corporate sector to stave off any economic pressure that strikes would even generate. It's and corporate another, MMT. Yeah, it's it's corporate MMT, and it's and it's literally an unending well. Um, so we still are on a level two where these strikes are profoundly important, and they can win material gains for the workers, which is the most important thing, but the effects are not economic, they're PR effects. And that's another, you know, that the situation would really have to scale, um, really have to scale in a way that is not present in our reality for it to, to implicate the economics. Now, let's also talk a little bit about uh, what the M NBC is saying. NBC headlines, survival tenants, landlords, uh, survival tenants and landlords brace for largest rent strike in decades. Um, Let's see, uh, tens of thousands, I'm quoting now, across the country will join one of the largest coordinated red strikes in decades on Friday, affecting three of America's largest cities, Los Angeles, New York, and Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Others have already begun. Um, and basically, the tenant union had 3,000 members before the crisis. By March, it grew to it grew 1,000, and by mid-April, it doubled to 8,000. She said, this is an organizer, the quoting now, she said... Um, hold on just one second. I need to get back to, you. okay. Uh, she said that the, that the large, that the, uh, uh, I lost my place. When you open the screen, it, uh, I, I can try to read it from the shared screen. It's okay. Put it back up. Put the shared screen back up. Um, Okay, yeah, yeah, it's this graph. People are looking for something to join because they know that they, because they don't know that, because they don't know that to do. The reason why our campaign is called Food Now uh, is because rent, we're not actually telling folks to choose survival, choose your life over paying your rent at this point. Um, so I think this is incredibly important. I think this is another thing to think about uh, possible ways of having solidarity with. And I think, again, there is another paradox. There is a paradox of, and it, it's, you know, it also applies to student loans, right? Like the, a proper rent strike is, I think we've talked about this on this show, would sort of imply like you have the capacity, but you're not doing it. And we're talking about a lot of people that don't have the capacity and are functionally doing it. And, you know, student loan crisis uh, describes, you know, millions of people that simply cannot pay off their student loans. So they're defaulting. I think there is still a useful, I, it's important to know that material difference. And there still is, again, at least the important political reframe of even if it is just out of necessity, that all of a sudden, if you join with thousands or millions of other people and do it, it does take on a different political force in the culture. Because, you know, that story, of course, is talking about the fact that people are broke because we're in a depression. But the frame is, oh, this organizing, this tenants union is growing a little bit and they're actually doing something. That politicizes something and that does have an inherent value. And I, and, you know, with all these stories, I, I just want to keep playing the, the paradox that, is this a properly understood strike, which would imply capacity that's being withheld? No. And at the same time, it is very, very important um, that people, you know, I, I think if millions of students several years ago said, all of a sudden said, wait a second, we collectively, we can't pay these things. So we won't. Fuck you. 
<laughs> let's make it their problem. That does shift the political calculus, and that is significant. Well, well, on that note, um, one thing that I've seen people doing is um, people have a different range of situations right now. Maybe some people can pay. Maybe some people in the same building can't. And what we're seeing is people using people who can pay are using that rent uh, to they're withholding it in solidarity with the people who can't. So they're saying, OK, uh, landlord, everyone who can't pay the rent, their rent has to be forgiven. And if you meet this demand, we will pay our rent. If you don't meet the demand, nobody's going to pay. And I think that's going to be fairly effective in many cases. Um, yep. I, I also want to caution people uh, like there are real uh, ramifications to going on rent strike. And oh, yeah. if you are the only unit in your building that does it, you're probably just going to get evicted. So oh, definitely don't be the, yeah, no, I would warn to... people to like speak with housing definitely. rights organizers who know what they're doing and talk to your neighbors and try to get your building on board if you want to do this. Otherwise, I mean, obviously, if you just literally can't pay the rent, you don't really have a choice in the matter. You might as well politicize it as part of a rent strike, but definitely be aware of uh, all the all the dangers involved. 100%. Uh, that's very important. All right. Uh, Donald Trump is freaking out might even need to sue his campaign manager because his numbers are slipping. And as I've said in the beginning, I think setting all politics aside, I hope that you will look very strongly into that, Mr. President. And Pascal's too tall. I mean, frankly, we know Short's not good, but he's too tall. So there's a lot of things that I think you should be checking out there. I heard, I heard he's working for Joe Biden, so I don't know. I mean, many people are saying it. I also heard that nobody would like, I wouldn't even know who he was if he wasn't associated with Donald Trump. Like that seems unfair. Yeah. I, he's the unhinged guy from social media, right? Brad Parcel. Like he's, I like, believe so. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's very funny. Or as I've heard him, he's the guy giving Donald Trump bad advice, which is totally unfair. You got to get Manafort out of jail. Yeah. You got to boost. Hey, him we're working on Flynn. Yeah. 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 Back, we're Flynn back in the administration. Where are the pardons? What kind of a, you know what? Donald Trump is such a pretend gangster. Do the pardons. You want to prove something. This is Donald Trump. When he's upset, he retreats deep into fantasy life. He says the virus will go away and we'll be at Yankee Stadium. And trust me, I've, I've been having a similar fantasy the past couple of days, but I'm not the president and I'm not going to say it on national television because it ain't happening. I know, he, look, Always, as much as we say, you know, look, is he delusional and everything else? Absolutely. But I do think you got to look at, there's always some method to this and it is keep juicing the stock market. And uh, maybe I can just bullshit my way to reelection. Is this three or four? This is three. And we'll play four afterward. We'll play four right afterwards because uh, this is a nice couplet. I hope to see football games and baseball games and basketball. Now, for basketball, you're going to have to have a little bit of a time. I don't know what they're going to do. Maybe they'll be able to play sort of toward the finals or the playoffs or whatever they're doing. Uh, I saw baseball's doing something very unusual. I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. I'd like to see the Yankees play at Yankee Stadium. I see they have some ideas for baseball that are very different. Uh, I guess I'm a traditionalist, but I think they'd be able to play at Yankee Stadium with uh, obviously smaller crowds and then the crowds would start to build as things get to be a little bit uh, better. No crowds. But no, crowds. Uh, no I, I think you're going to see some uh, some big things happening. And again, this is going away. This is going away. I think we're going to come up with vaccines and all, but this is going away. And when it's gone, we're going to be doing a lot of things. Uh, and again, you have to look other areas. There are areas, you know, we all look at New York and we see New York and New Jersey and some of these very high density places where they're doing a very good job. It's just, you know, it's not easy. Uh, but you have areas that are really uh, at a very low point and, and really heading, I always say heading south quickly. And that's what we want. So we'll see how it all works out. I think it's working very good. How about one more? Anybody? He looks really tired. 
Yeah, we really want things to head south quickly. That's like the most honest thing he said. He yeah, looks really, really w tired. When he says that phrase, he's thinking about going to Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's not, it's not in Mar-a-Lago because it's not high density. Oh um, and uh, of course, in more good news, uh, it, he's, he's, it's going to be eradicated. This is number four. It's on the way. Don't worry about it. Without a vaccine, sir, why do you think the virus will just be gone? It's going to go. It's going to leave. It's going to be gone. It's going to be eradicated. Uh, and uh, it might take longer. It might be in smaller sections. It, it'll be, it won't be what we had. And, and we also learned a lot. Again, if you have a flare up in a certain area, if you have a, I call them burning embers, boom. Yep. I can put it out. We know how to put it out now, but we put it out and now we're equipped. Now we have more ventilators than anyone thought was possible. I don't know about that. I, you know, it's really interesting to watch the because Trump can go in both directions. But at the end of the day, he's obviously terrified about getting reelected and endlessly wants to bullshit up the economy. So he goes in the like, it's not such a big deal i mean you know whatever there's burning embers but it's gonna go away then you have the pandemic podcast with steve bannon where these guys see an opportunity not only for re-election but for like to exit the kali yuga and like look that up that might actually be literal <laughs> in terms of like the you know sort of like right-wing apocalyptic dimensions of that thinking so it's it, that's just the perfect Trump usually is able to circle in between all of these positions well in his own sort of like bullshitter intuitive way. But when it comes to the economy and everything being the best and everybody being out and then obviously not one of the quotes I think was, I'm not losing a fucking Joe Biden yeah. <laughs> in that AP piece. <laughs> The the part of Trump, like we're, we're there's no we're not talking any carnage on the streets. We're not talking about globalists. We're not like it's going to be great. It's going to go away. She's a great guy. Like it, it, we don't even hear Chinese virus anymore. This guy wants to tamp this down. Even the even the really, you know, even the dimensions of it that play to like Breitbart politics. He's free. I'll give this one away for free to the Biden campaign, but they should be clipping everything where he says that it's just going to go away because when we have that second uh, infection, you know, surge after the shutdown and the soft reopening, like we're going to have seen that this entire shutdown, which was meant to scale up testing and create a chance for us to catch up and not have this problem again, it's going to be just as bad. And like, he's doing nothing. And he's saying he's doing nothing that it's just going to go away. So like, this is, it's exactly what he should be saying. Well, why would they do something so politically smart when they could just do more xenophobic fear mongering about China? If he stays losing to Biden, the meltdown is going to be- It's going to be hilarious. Unbelievable. That, that is actually the most- Are you kidding me? Entertaining he scenario right now. The left won't even vote for him and I'm losing yeah, to yeah. The left won't vote for him. He falls asleep and I'm losing. This is totally unfair. <laughs> <laughs> the tantrums will be, you know what? If you want to look at this just on, if you've, if you've gone completely black pill on this and you want a reason uh, among the obvious ones to vote to prevent a second Trump term, just look at aesthetically for a second. Oh. The comedy implications of that tantrum are yeah. Mwah. yeah, chef's kiss. This guy will be on Twitter for years. Oh my God, it was stolen. It was unfair. He's going to sue his campaign staff. He'll he'll pro he'll try he'll probably he's going like to try to get people to revolt in an armed uprising, and then we'll see just how lazy all of his supporters really are. He will try to he will try to call a disconnected phone number from the eighties to like mm -hmm. somebody in the Bonanno family to like see about Kushner. It is going to be awesome. Yeah, really, the best reason to support Biden. It is absolutely the best. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Who he puts in positions of power, moderately better improvements than Trump, and also seeing Trump's meltdown. 
Uh, no, it's it? it's it's DACA and meltdown. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Keep Biden, it simple. <laughs> Biden doesn't deserve to win, but Trump definitely deserves to lose. But that Biden not deserving to win is what makes it so good. Yeah, that's what makes it actually so delicious. Because because Trump is Trump does have some good like '80s positivity thinking. Like he is the type of guy. Like if Bernie beat him, he would say like Bernie did what I did, except. He had a better staff. My staff lied to me. Yeah, he just does Ryan's pre. But he had. But he respects. He respected Bernie on some level because Bernie had like actual energy and enthusiasm. And then even and even and and honestly, even like if he lost to like someone like Harris, it's Trump. So he would be the first one to say like, I mean, what are you gonna do? It's history. First black woman. First black woman. It's history. It's history. Many many people said I actually helped make that happen. It was time. But if it's Joe Biden, he's good. Like, that guy can't even stay awake on fucking Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, let's hope. <laughs> oh, to be delicious. fair, my brain also shuts down when listening to Hillary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that was actually the most relatable moment uh, post-nomination uh, for sure. Uh Let's um let's listen to let's let's go to Fox and Friends. This is clip number six. They're really, really, really on the reopen beat. And it's it's significant because I think Tucker is on the reopen beat too. And uh at least to some extent. And that's interesting because Tucker, you know, Tucker was the guy who flew to Mar-a-Lago. He convinced Trump to take this seriously, and he's more on like the Bannon contingent, which is they were correct ahead of the curve and saying that this is very serious and this is primarily deployed to generate a cold war setting and go into an absolute frenzy of china bigotry and china nonsense now again we can't be stupid about this and there are things like repatriating supply chains which absolutely need to happen i would never you know, don't cede that to the populist right. That's an extremely foolish move. But at the same time, we also need to fully reject uh, this crazy Cold War nonsense emanating, uh, you know, from the Tucker and Bannon wing. That is the bigger picture. The immediate picture is DeSantis and Kemp and others don't want to play, pay unemployment insurance. And we got to get back to work. And this is very, I mean, there are reasons like with the unemployment insurance, which are very narrow Republican reasons. But I, I think, um, again, just like the Democrats who will not do anything that, is means that isn't means tested and won't provide any social insurance for people, this is ideological. Like people shouldn't fool themselves that America's corporate sector and financial system are under threat right now. They're not. They're safely bailed out. They have monopoly power. They're more consolidated now than they were before the crisis. Now, I'm not in any way, it's great that people are striking. It's great that politics are flowing. It, there's opportunity, but don't be naive of like, oh my God, you know, we're not working. They, they figured that out. They, they're okay. In fact, there's enormous advantages that are already probably being absorbed into corporate strategy for a lighter workforce. And I, I think the signal that as the Financial Times reported last week, like, this is amazing. We're like in a jobs depression, but the stock market's doing great. That's horrifying information <laughs> being provided for these people. But in the right wing imagination and discourse, it's not, it's, it's an opportunity as we talked about yesterday to do, do disaster capitalism, to take away corporate responsibility on worker safety, to assault OSHA regulations and things like that. And it is a visual and ideological and campaign point, which is that we're back to normal and everybody's out. And even in the worst of times, even if you literally could die from basic exposure, that's no excuse for not participating in the game. And those, and so the, these are powerful and compelling reasons, but I don't want, but I want people to, and there might've even been a moment several weeks ago where there was some legitimate questions about how afraid are they about workforce depression and how it relates to the overall structure of the financial system. But 
post bailout and post some stabilization, the signals are kind of catastrophic. It's just that you can have a depression level unemployment crisis and things are ticking right along. So, you know, I don't, I don't think that's the reason, frankly, I know it's not the reason that they're so concerned to get people back out. Yeah. I mean, I think they're, they're making a wrong calculation there. Like, I think this is going to be a more severe and prolonged thing than they think. And I right. think they can just like, you know, top, and that's what's happened, right? Like this $2 trillion uh, uh, bailout and 1200 went to the individuals when like it's that equal amounts out to about 7,500 uh, basically, or depending on if you go by worker or citizen, like that rest of that 1,200, that $1,200 was so you didn't think about where the rest of the money is going to. Right. And it's going into corporate pockets to f- for future control over labor. Right. right. And you know what? It might work politically because the Democrats haven't delivered anything for people yet. Like even I, I hate Trump so much I know $1,200 isn't shit in the grand scheme of things, but I'm sure I will have a moment when I get my Trump bucks where I'm like, oh, thanks, Trump. That was nice. And like, think about how it is for people who have been beaten down and taught to expect nothing their whole entire lives. You get $1,200. Yeah, maybe it's not rational, but it, it, it feels like a lifeboat. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Jamie. Keep talking about space communism. I'll see you in 2020. Uh, it's a big threat to my reelection. Um, well, everybody should remember, before, you know, like watching, watching people complain about Trump getting his signature on these. I mean, Schumer's on still envelope. on that. You saw Schumer. That was a smart thing to do. It was not only is it a smart thing to do, and not only is is, is Schumer's. Schumer's politics are so myopic that it is actually horrifying. It's like, it's, it's so limited and narrow that it actually becomes extravagant in how demented it is. Like that, he, this is even a worry at this moment. Uh, and sorry, Trump's 100% right. It, during the Obama stimulus, Obama put out record tax cuts. And the behavioral economist twerps were like, don't tell people their tax cuts because then they'll be less likely to spend it. Now, let's just think about the fact that the Obama administration cut numbers and the stimulus was decent. The bailout was horrible. There were some good aspects of the Obama stimulus, but it was way smaller than it needed to be. That's a consensus. And if you read the policy formulation process, it is as simple as, well, it can't be that number. That sounds too high, right? It is, there was no like macroeconomic West Wing. I mean, probably a lot of putzes who thought they were in the West Wing, but it was as simple as, no, can't be that number. That's too high, right? So they didn't just say, we just need to have a massive stimulus because we're going to a serious depression, recession. Right, they were already willing to compromise on the merits all over the place. But then on the flip side, when some behavioral economics twerps, which was the trendy thing at that point, with books like books like Nudge came in and said, if you tell people these are tax cuts, they will be more likely to hold the money than spend it. We need people out spending, which is of course the supply side, you know, argument. It's like, okay, well, that you take seriously. Right. The political disaster of not making clear to tens of millions of people that the Obama administration just gave them a tax cut because some dweeb has told you some behavioral economics formulation. And then that's why you could get into 2010. And there, obviously there was many other factors, but it was, it was not an insignificant thing that when people's payroll went back up, they thought he had increased their taxes and they didn't realize, no, he gave you massive tax cuts and it's gone back to normal. It was read as an increase. And of course, the Republicans campaigned again, right? Like, I mean, because the Republicans are always going to make the right the right move on that. So, you know, don't whine about Trump doing that. Do it. Mm. It's just it's unbelievable. I I, 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 honestly, if you fill out this form and this form and this form and you can prove that you worked from this date to this date and made this amount of money, the Democrats will pay for your Cobra. (laughs) Right, exactly. 
Uh, and I will give you uh, something called a Pelosi check, which is an aspirational check that reflects the visualization exercises you're having to pretend you have money. And that's our answer to Donald Trump. But of course, you wouldn't use my name in the visualization exercises because that would be unseemly. All right, no, you would, you would name it after a poisonous snake, right. which is a, so much better. A BOGO uh, ice cream coupon that you can get when you subscribe to a new seamless service. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, the, and the ice cream you, company's a major donor. <laughs> right, and also if you can prove that your income wasn't in, in excess of 50,000 a year last year, because of course if it was, oh. you're just rolling in it. You should be able to buy the ice cream. Yeah, Jesus Christ, good. the <laughs> Democrats are such a disaster. All right, let's play clip number six. You know, that beach was open and people could make the decisions. The problem is, though, Brian, they started to see more people going to the hospitals after that weekend, after all those images were released in California with Corona. So I think the governors have to make tough, tough decisions because they don't want a relapse of all of this. That wouldn't make them look good. Their their residents would be dying. And then you have, you know, people like my mom is very sick. And as much as I want to go out and I want to I still want everyone to play by the rules, because when I finally right. do get to go home. But is your mom going to the beach? But is your mom going to the beach? No, but Brian, you know, eventually she's going to be around family again. I understand both sides. I really do. I just don't want a resurgence of this. Um, You know, I I just don't want us to go through all of this. It's been it's been hard for everyone at different levels. Yes, Steve. Look, ultimately, from the very beginning. That is so awesome because that's everything right there. Ainsley, classic Republican move takes all of a sudden takes this seriously because her mom could be implicated by it. Classic. Mm-hmm. Pure moi. That's the all of a sudden I, I support gay rights because I have a gay kid dynamic. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And then Kilmeade is such a bullheaded schmuck that he's just like, yeah, yeah, so what, what, what? Your mom's going to go body surfing? Yeah, yeah. Maybe what the sk- hell? Maybe skip the pier, grandma. <laughs> I just make bro. Bright- To be fair, fair, he probably doesn't understand how it works. Well, they all they all do. I mean, Huckabee said that yesterday, right? Like the idea is like actually sick people or vulnerable people need like we all need to be quarantined. They need to the extent that's humanly possible be isolated, right? Like you can be quarantined, you still actually wait, maybe maybe you need to help a neighbor get groceries, maybe you need to coordinate to help somebody in your family. I mean, God, some of this and Look, if you have to do some of this type of thing uh, and you can't travel and you're doing like, I could speak to this personally. It's extremely stressful and pressing um, to have to coordinate things like this when you literally cannot physically be somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's horrible. So that's another, I mean, Huckabee said that on the clip yesterday. Like, and again, it, it, it's funny. I don't want to overdo it because it is just such basic, disgusting Fox Chamber of Commerce bullshit and propaganda. But that idea that has been spread out that you can, that, oh, well, you just get the sick people. It's like, it it it, it does reflect such an atomized worldview mm-hmm. that just isn't true. It just isn't, you know, it, 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 it there's nothing highfalutin about this. This is an epidemic and people are literally interdependent. So, you know, that that kind of thought process of like, oh, well, you know, if you're, if you're yeah. sick, then you can just, obviously you can just be, you know, sealed from life. Like, Remember, how exactly are we doing this? <laughs> yeah. I don't Remember, know, calm down, honey. Uh, Remember Johan Hari's book, Chasing the Scream about the drug war? And he's, he's talking about, this moment in Uruguay when it's like, okay, we're act- the progressives are actually going to get what they want in policy. We're right. going to stop the drug, the the carceral drug war. And even then, you have the moment like, shit. I hope this works, and it doesn't just like. I hope the critics aren't right, basically, right? I mean, this is their version of that, where Ains is right. like, damn, actually, my grandma's super frail. I mean. How did they not think of that before this, by the way? Like you're, this should have informed you. That's informed the way I've approached this issue on this podcast from like February. So that like, I mean, I'm glad it's come to her now, 
I guess. But I mean, it's just hilarious. Like the way Kill Me, it's like, is she going to the beach though? Like, dude. Like maybe the people that are gonna bring her food are maybe going to come in contact with somebody who went to the beach. This thing is what's known as contagious. It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. even require that much of a thought process, right? It's like, okay, Brian, I went to, or somebody near my mom went to the grocery store to get her her groceries and crossed paths with somebody who just got back from a crowded beach. And, well. you know, sure, like it may be in other cases, again, like I, you know, sure, if you're, probably people it seems like with healthy immune systems can get away with that level of risk an immunocompromised person can't so therefore we yeah. minimize as much risk as possible i mean it's it's a 30 second thought process well i think it shows that they do understand it they just don't care when it's not their mom who's under threat no yeah they're they're willing to balance sort of the propaganda value and benefit to fascism uh and the Republican Party uh, alongside the health of their relatives. It's like all these MAGA chuds at the protest, you know? If it's really safe to reopen the economy, why won't you get out of your car? <laughs> Karen Pence has an explanation. Speaking of uh, people just being complete fucking idiots about this, uh, played it yesterday. Mike Pence was at the Mayo Clinic. He wasn't wearing a mask. Um, I think like in general, I mean, obviously not, obviously we look forward to a day where walking around the neighborhood, you're not going to wear a mask. But I think like, I think the cultural practice that has emerged in Asia, I mean, I'm certainly never going to fly without a mask on hundred percent. Maybe not even go to a movie. I mean, yeah, honestly, like it is going to be more part of our lives. And, and, you know, it was, it was interesting I was talking to somebody about that actually who had traveled to, to Asia a year ago and, and they were like, yeah, you know, I didn't really think about it one way or another, but my just sort of bias or idea was that, you know, people wear masks to protect themselves and, you know, didn't have any judgment about it. Fair enough, you know, but the, the, she was saying it's actually like, no, in, in this context, it's, it's actually, it's, it's you're doing it for other people, same way reason we're prescribed to do it. It's actually considered just proper social etiquette for other people's well-being mm -hmm. uh, that you wear a mask um, in mass public transport and or flying on airplanes or whatever. And I, I mean, look, I, I, I think it's a no brainer. I mean, it's one of those things that you just think like, why haven't we incorporated this practice for flying before? It's so obvious. And part of the obvious, you know, yeah. I was just going to say, like, in the times we've flown for TMBS live shows, almost every time I fly, like, I feel like I come down with something. And then if you right. look at the graphics of how germs spread through planes, I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense, actually. A whole lot yeah. of sense. And I, I mean, it's, it's kind of a mind fuck for me because there is something very uh, kind of individualizing or neoliberal even about saying the onus is on the individual to do their part, wear a mask, blah, blah, blah. But, but when that rises to the level of culture and you can change the culture of a society and it convince people to care for others, that is the opposite of neoliberalism. Totally. And that's what Pence is failing to do. And he, that's why he right. didn't wear the mask is because he that's doesn't why. want to send that cultural signal that we should be wearing masks because that's cuck stuff or whatever the right wing thinks about it. No, I mean, this stuff is, I mean, it's, 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 uh, yeah, this, this is like when people started to, you know, political leaders would take an AIDS test. Like mm -hmm. that was a signal, like you can't relegate this or you can't have homophobia dictate how you look at this disease. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really important. I would actually just say like, look, again, I think another dialectic is obviously individual and social and both things are real. The, the real neoliberal problem and the real despicable thing we saw in New York was Andrew Cuomo saying everybody needs to do it. And they're like, okay, Andrew, right. how are we getting it to everybody? Exactly. That is the yeah. new, and the other, and by the way, the other structural problem is, uh, look, we should wear these things on planes, uh, no doubt. I also have no doubt that the airline industry is, uh, cuts corners and is disgusting and totally doesn't properly clean things. <laughs> so that's another thing uh, that we need to look at regulatorily uh, yeah, yeah. as well. But um, uh, this is, yeah. Can I just preface, I want to say before Please. I bought this, this Pence clip, I can't remember her name, Mrs. Karen Pence. Pence. Karen, Karen Pence. Mother. 
uh, just know that she's lying. It's I, I think it's more interesting to to watch a liar when you know that they're lying. Um, so just know that she's lying about this because the uh, Mayo Clinic told them beforehand that masks are protocol. I mean, fucking obviously, yeah. right? It's a hospital. They just but deleted anyway. the tweet that uh, yeah. when I said that they told them. So just that's good, important context. Know that this good Christian woman who follows Mike Pence to every the dinner meeting he has with another woman, right? This whatever they're um, or they're so they claim. Yeah, she's they a are liar. a couple of liars. She is a liar. Like she's yeah. lying, lying Karen. Oh, lying she's, Karen. It's Karen. Lying, lying Karen. Ooh. Lion mother. Lion mother. Karen. To that, I do have to ask you about your husband not wearing the mask when he was touring the Mayo Clinic. Why wasn't he wearing one? That's a great question. I'm glad that you asked me. Um, first of all, it was a great visit to Mayo. They're doing amazing research with uh, the blood from recovering COVID-19 patients. And as our medical experts have told us, uh, wearing a mask prevents you from spreading the disease. And knowing that he doesn't have COVID-19, uh, he didn't wear one. It was actually after he left Mayo Clinic that he found out that they had a policy of asking everyone to wear a mask. So, you know, someone who's worked on this, uh, this whole uh, task force for over two months is not someone who would have done anything to offend anyone or, or hurt anyone or scare anyone. So um, I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to yeah. talk about that. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. Who he didn't want to offend was Republicans who think masks are lame. Yeah, exactly. There like was the one specific group you didn't want to offend. The masks are for pussies exactly. contingent. Yes, God. exactly. Showing strength. Yes, and we will put people's health and well-being at risk. I mean, that's it's also just visually, it is so... I understand. I think actually, I mean, visually they wanted to, to register as he's so fucking strong that look at all these other people, including security people wearing it, but it yeah. just looks ridiculous. Yeah. It looks like, Oh, it looks or, like a 12 year old who's like insisting on not wearing his seatbelt. Yeah. It's like, but, okay, Mike, we get it. Whatever. Wait, do you Stop being this? a fucking idiot. Hold on. Are we, I need to bring this picture into the, uh, <laughs> okay one second sorry I, I i think a lot of people might remember this photo of uh mike pence's trip to nasa um if not here let me just share the screen in two seconds he did not wear a space helmet and uh he, here's what it looks like um it's a critical space flight <laughs> do not touch oh yeah <laughs> wow that's so alpha man yeah, add it to the Pantheon. I also like Trump staring directly into the sun. Directly into the sun, was... yeah. Well, it was cool when he did that. First of all, <laughs> that was actually also cool. have done that. I've done that exact. I did. I think I did that that day, even after Trump did it. But... <laughs> wow, you got to be able to see what? some of it, right? You want to <laughs> prove that you want to prove that you're tougher than Trump. I'm like, I want to know. I mean, how many how many times can you say like I can experience something the president of the United States experienced earlier today? Oh. my retinas being wow well, that's that's uh, <laughs> quite the flex matt apparently uh pence wore a mask today four minutes ago in uh at another lame, lame. rhino globalist oh, cock what a rhino soy boy <laughs> rhino soy boy globalist cock <laughs> covering up his rhino horn probably <laughs> why don't you have a lunch of tofu with that <laughs> <laughs> some, some french fries <laughs> uh all right well so we're we're headed by a death cult uh and america is a third world country with a gucci belt let's go check out the most embarrassing ineffective opposition party in modern uh liberal democratic history jim kramer is talking with nancy pelosi now, Jim Cramer, actually, I believe, before he got into the stock game, uh, was a young member, I think, of the Spartacus Society. He, mm -hmm. he had a Marxist phase in college. So even though he's been pumping stocks and being an apologist for the capitalist system for decades, um, there is a small part of Jim, I guess, that still has some materialist concerns. Now, there is no part of Nancy Pelosi <laughs> that still has those concerns. <laughs> Check out this exchange on CNBC. This, this is actually really, I mean, this, this is just 
appalling on every level. As I listen to some to the changes that you're talking about, telemedicine, a study at home, I think, OK, we're in a world where people who are wealthy and people who have jobs, contracts, they can stay at home. I see another world. I see the possibility of two societies developing. Society has to be out there every day in the masses, subways, risking themselves. And then this other group of people who are safe at home with all sorts of computers, very rich, a society that is not what you and I want to see. How do we prevent that? Well, let us do it all together. This is a moment of truth for our country about who we are. What is the humanity of America? Uh, we wanted to support the small businesses. They are the vitality of our economy, the dreams that people have, uh, the entrepreneurship, the risk they're willing to take for an idea. And so that's why we all gathered and wrote the PPP uh, for that so that we can try to reach as many people as possible uh, for their jobs and their businesses. Uh, but that was not being done in a way that reached the underbanked and the rest to re address your disparity issues. And we, in our second bill, we were very proud uh, to be able to do that as we uh, increase funding for hospitals and testing essential to how soon we can open up. But the, uh, if you gave everyone in America, every child in America, uh, a laptop, he or she may still not have access or seniors or anyone, but think about the kids in school and the rest if they don't have service. So one of the things we'd like to see in, as we go forward is that we will have funding for uh, broadband, uh, always on, high speed, all over America. Because kids now, even if they have a laptop, they can't even go to a library or a school or a, uh, a cafe or any place in order to, um, uh, to have access uh, to the network. So that is a bit, that digital divide is now becoming a digital chasm, and we have to really address that. So there are many disparities, whether it's access to testing and uh, health care that goes, would go with that, whether it's access to credit, which is what we try to correct in the other bill, whether it's access uh, to, to the, uh, the internet, which is our means of cooperate, uh, co uh, communication, and also if it's respect uh, for the postal service which is for many of these people, and especially largely in rural areas, as well as urban, uh, how they get their uh, medicines or their products that they've ordered and the rest. Uh, so we have to understand what connects us as a country, what unifies as a country. And I'm very confident uh, that, that when people realize uh, the assault that this has made, not only the health, the lives of the people and the livelihood of the people, but to the sense of community of who we are as a country, we'll have an opportunity to do something working together, recognizing the role that every aspect of our society plays in it, the public sector, the private sector, et cetera. The public sector, when we do our bill, state and local, that really means honor, honor our, our heroes, our healthcare workers, our what? Uh, first responders, our trans people, our food delivery services, uh, it's, uh, food providers How long is in, this? in every way, postal service, uh, the list goes on and on. Okay. All right, guys, obviously that's terrifying on any number of levels. I will say the last part about recognizing Barack Obama put out a tweet a couple of weeks ago, basically saying, you know, something to the effect of like, we see you. Uh, great. You should see everybody. I, you know, what's funny is I actually think the, the whole act of like seeing and recognizing and hearing is something that should be pretty universalized. That should be like a human to human trait across basically all boundaries. The issue is people are not being delivered for. They don't have hazard pay. Your former press secretary is helping Amazon suppress these workers and propagandizing on Twitter. That's the problem. Now, there was a lot going on there. And actually, I mean, as terrible and as ineffectual and as embarrassing as Nancy Pelosi is, I actually haven't really seen her be sort of like boring Trump level incoherent like she was in that clip. But the bottom line is, is that you have a CNBC anchor who is known as like the clown stock tip guy asking the basic inequality question. And she has mumbo jumbo about small business without anything specific. She doesn't even have 
well, you know, Jim, we need to upgrade the small business administration because it's not designed to handle the type of delivery that we're doing. The, the only system that we have to really mass deploy resources like this is the Fed and that favors the financial sector and corporate conglomerates. So we need to upgrade the small business administration. We need to work on that. Okay, fine. Then she brags about stuff and they're still doing this. Schumer and Pelosi are bragging about extra money for hospitals in a pandemic. I mean, I'm sorry. If that's your version of a political win, then what What are you like? Okay. I mean, I get that's like saying like, hey, I lost the 10, you know, I lost the set 6-1, but I did manage to hold my serve once. So I think we can see some real improvements in my game here. And then the rest was, okay, sure. We should do broadband, fine, whatever. Good. And then just pablum. I mean, just, honestly, just, just, just violent pablum. Who is she saying needs to work together? Because the problem is she's working Everyone. together too well with the fucking Republicans and everything they want to do. They, Pelosi needs to stop working together with the people she likes to work together with. Like, I, I don't know. And that, that seems to me like, stop criticizing us. Stop, criti- stop criticizing what we're doing. Work together, meaning, you know, censor yourself because we're, we're mm-hmm. just trying to get through this together with our Republican pals. Yeah. I mean, she's horrible. She's just world historically bad. Disgraceful. And there's, there's, there's no way that she turns the, her leadership into a success. So she should get out now and let somebody else get on with it because there's nothing she can do. And like, Ryan would have been better than her. I want to yeah, say this really 100%. quickly. 100%. We, look, I understand because, look, he was, she was getting challenged from sort of, I guess, the right, although essentially it's very similar politics. And there was an argument that Nancy Pelosi, who had founded the Progressive Caucus and was you know, whatever. And honestly, I just wasn't as invested in that argument as I should have been. I didn't, you know, this is the give and take of my politics because I think some of these things, frankly, don't matter as much as as maybe some people think they do. But uh, Ellison mattered a hell of a lot and uh, Ryan would have been a better Speaker of the House. I mean, just even on the basic level of this guy's got decades ahead of him to at least consider... The idea of delivering for his constituents. I mean, this is this is a this is a aged, ultra wealthy person who is could not be more divorced from any aspect of working people's lives. It, it, it is appalling. Access it's absolutely appalling in the pandemic where people are starving and have housing security issues and like red lines are going six miles long in cities is just like insane to me. thank you yeah. access to credit I, Except, like are you kidding me so i okay good so just who's going to be collecting on the interest there thanks nancy pelosi the like most awesome ambitious yeah. thing they've done is offer cobra <laughs> subsidies like it's insane and the first time i watched this i was like damn i can't believe jim kramer let her filibuster for three and a half minutes and i'm like damn she really feel like cannot filibuster for three minutes well like, making now it I know, more equitable for people in this country. Now I know why the, the person who sent me this clip told me not to bother listening to her answer <laughs> because the, the main reason they wanted me to watch it was because it supports their se- thesis that Jim Cramer is secretly still a Trotskyist, <laughs> which I would be totally into. Um, also, on the topic of we see you, we hear you, you're valid, right? Um, That's also a thing that Joe Biden said in a tweet addressed to Bernie supporters. Like, come along. I see you. I hear you. The journalist Molly Lampert did a little deep dive and found out that that phrase comes from one of those consulting firms that they bring in to try to, like, smooth things over when employees are mad at their bosses for fucking them over. And uh, that's that's like utter. It's it's, pure manager culture. It's It's HR speak. When she closed the wing. Uh, right she worked at sdk knickerbocker she's worked on hillary's campaign and all that shit it's like it's just code it's code and you know you want look i will feel seen when larry summers is told he'll never work at democratic party politics again right i will feel seen and heard when that happens like okay it's it's like say the like the charitable uh you know backstory is that summers himself or someone favorable to summers floated that Biden still hasn't said anything, just like he didn't say anything about the Bloomberg thing. Um, 
uh, being on his cabinet, right? Like Biden, those are trial balloons are being graciously waved by by Joe Biden. Like, yes, also, maybe I'm, I'm sorry. Are. I'm I'm sorry. We know Larry Summers is going to be involved. I, yeah, you know, it's like I, I get. I, I look, it is important. A spe- look, people spread rumors. People misreport news. People take people take things that don't have base to them and run with them. And that is a serious problem. And even as we are, you know, I don't consider myself to be a journalist We're analysts, whatever, of course we have to be careful about those things. So yes, has there been an official offer to Larry Summers? No. Do we know that he's going to be part of this? No, we absolutely don't. It is not well reported. And at the same time, I could tell you as an analyst and as somebody who has some understanding of the democratic party, and Joe Biden in the last couple of decades, Larry Summers is going to be part of it. Yeah. Like it, that, that is a 99 to one. And not only will Larry Summers be part of it, he's gonna actually appeal to a lot of people in the coalition because they're gonna spend a lot of time talking to when they, fi- if they actually finally start campaigning, they're gonna say, we took the country, we, we had the same thing in 2008 and we took the country out of it. And that is, go- again, that the demos that they're frankly most interested in that message will appeal to so we shouldn't be naive about its efficacy but like yes that that's what i'm trying to say there's a dialectic the larry summer story is weekly reported and we don't know and i will also tell you larry summers is absolutely going to be involved in economic formulation of the joe biden campaign administration if you think otherwise i don't and and if he isn't it is not because of any any ethical or ideological or anything. It is because Larry Summers is so personally annoying and abrasive that he has annoyed enough people in the campaign trust that they're going to go with somebody else to do the same thing. By the way, it's the same reason. I mean, Summers was part of the Obama administration. Geithner was way less prestigious, but he got treasury because he's not as fucking annoying as Summers. And things being as they are, Larry Summers was actually better in the context of the Obama administration than Geithner, who is one of the biggest low-key villains of the last uh, 15, 20 years. I mean, just just truly horrible, even down to his his post-administration work. But anyways, being that as it may, uh, another great Democratic hero, Andrew Cuomo. This is is perfect. This, this is, is amazing. This is amazing because Andrew Cuomo just look, Joe Biden and the people around like Joe Biden is a right wing Democrat, and it is not, and there are ideological oppositions to things like Medicare for all, no question. That being said, uh Joe Biden uh and and uh other people in the National Democratic Party, there is there is a little bit more truth, I think, to the idea that given conditions, just like even the Obama stimulus, there's some progressive stuff in it. And, you know, Biden said to Politico for a, a fleeting moment of sentient, of, of, of like kind of coherence the other day, he said, uh, I want a much bigger stimulus and I want it. And he even spelled out some of the ways in which it could be more, more progressively targeted. I say that all to say that, and certainly Gavin Newsom is somebody who has not in any kind of, I would say not in a structural way, but is absolutely something that you can track his career, particularly in the context of California, which is ahead of the curve as a Bernie state. He's a very neoliberal mayor of San Francisco, and he's been a relatively progressive-ish governor of California. Andrew Cuomo is more committed ideologically to austerity and Republican economics than maybe any other, I mean, I guess with the exception, I mean, obviously Pelosi's up there, but he and Schumer have been on different sides of arguments about funding for New York, where Schumer's on the progressive side. Andrew Ooh. Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo is committed to this. Andrew Cuomo is hacking Medicaid right now. So think of this like ruthless commitment and the waves of hospital closures and everything else that he's done to help make the crisis and pandemic as bad as it's been in New York. And then look at this perfect sort of boardroom liberalism moment of the story of Andrew Cuomo and a set of masks and what they were used for in Albany. Self-portrait. 
that was done by American people. This is a self-portrait of America, okay? That's a self-portrait of America. Pause it. And you know what it's- For those listening, this is a mural of Basques. So the same guy, and I saw, and I, look, I found this disturbing as hell. I think every time I see somebody walking on the street without a mask, I do think, what the fuck? The other day I saw some guy walking on a mask and an NYPD pull up beside him and say, where's your mask? And I was terrified that that's happening. So this governor that has put that policy in motion and this does not have any state strategy for giving people the resources they need, including on ones he says, you need to be out in public wearing, has no problem doing a press conference showing a piece of hokey bullshit public art that is literally just a waste of masks. So that's what he's showing. I mean, if, if he's planning on ungluing those masks right after that and distributing them to people who need them, then fine. But I don't think that thought even crossed his mind. Uh, I don't so think you want them gluing your nose sent. either. <laughs> these were uh, these were sent to Albany and they just used them for this purpose. Yes. I like supporters who are like Cuomo's my daddy sort of thing. Oh, boy. It spells, it spells love. <laughs> that's what it spells. You have to look carefully, but that's what the American people are saying. We received thousands of masks from all across America. Yeah, evidently. Unsolicited, in the mail, homemade, creative, personal, with beautiful notes from all across the country, literally, just saying, thinking about you, we care, we love you, we want to help. And this is just people's way of saying we care and we want to help. This is what this country is about. And this is what Americans are about. A little bit more of this and a little bit less of the partisanship and the ugliness oh and this God. country would be a better place. So, uh, you know, what I love is if he was saying all of that and some of that is genuinely great rhetoric in front of a, uh, a, a flow chart where he's explaining that he's going to increase Medicaid funding because it's about love mm -hmm. and love is about saving lives and the well-being of all. How big a staff does he have? Like he was just able to task a couple of them to put that thing together. Who put that together? Like what, there's nothing, literally nothing they could uh, be doing besides, you know. That a, is a metaphor for democratic ineffectualness to give anything yeah. other than like pandering visualization. For we are, yeah. Material needs is just like too good. I have to feel like I'm living in the simulation. We're going to turn the labor that we do not deserve from you, frankly, uh, as a party. Uh, and we're going to turn it into a symbolic sort of propaganda tool that we can say, look at, at how much people love us. Look at me, Andrew Cuomo. Everyone from around the country is sending in masks that say, I love New York. On them. And frankly, I mean, again, for everybody, and I'll always say Trump is absolutely appalling and Trump needs to go. But for people singularly obsessed with Trump, that doesn't sound a little, a lot of love, a lot of things happening. Like, Really? Like this guy with an atrocious, despicable record mm -hmm. who you write these absolutely just embarrassing. I mean, you talk about, you know, people I am with all of these like, oh, get on my knees, whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, that talking about being a Cuomo sexual is one of the greatest acts uh, of self, oh. self debasement and embarrassing shit I've ever seen in my life. And you and, and this guy is out. Of course, it's smarter. Of course, it's whatever. But I mean, what, what, the, what is that? There's a lot of love, a lot of things happening. And again, as Brennan said, I mean, that is the modern Democratic Party. We, we, and, and I think, you know, in some ways, because there's less, the third way policy template 
uh, works a lot better when you're riding a tech bubble and you're deregulating after the end of the Cold War. There's a lot more room to gin up broader based gains in like the professional managerial class. There isn't the same kind of policy maneuvers around anymore for that type of politics. Yeah. Look at Macron. Um, all right, let's do one final piece of sound. Uh, for some of you, you've been going back and thinking about the Obama administration a bit. And I don't know if everybody remembers, but there was this big thing that Obama was uh, going to have death panels and blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, again, the proper left answer is that private insurance is a form of death panel in and of itself, literally a parasite industry that is trying to leverage uh, basically selling you a product and then not providing those products and services to you. Yeah, their decision, uh, <laughs> the, the panel's decision in that case is easy. Do you have money to pay us? Yes. Oh, you get to live. No, you die. There's the death panel. Right. And even if you do, uh, you're probably going to go in debt for life. And yes, and a lot of those death panels are not even, I mean, the big melodrama with the Obamas is going to be some, you know, some group of evil doctors. Uh, that Those death <laughs> panels are more like you're calling customer service and somebody who probably could barely afford a health care themselves is telling you, no, your kid's going to die. So yes, there are tons of death panels. I will say though, to, to be fair, as they say, I believe Ezek Emanuel, it was Rahm Emanuel's doctor brother was somebody that the right wing was very fixated on back then. And uh, he has actually himself said in the last couple of weeks that we be, need to question the value of life above a certain age. So maybe psychologically, uh, they were intuiting something correct about the mindset of these people. And, uh, but of course, it's coming from the right. Uh, so not a very actual strong interest in human life. And here is Ben Shapiro, who I have practically seen be on the border of saying that's, you know, like masturbation might be a form of abortion. I mean, this guy takes this really seriously. That's wasted sperm you got there. Here he is with Dave Rubin. Okay. With maybe a Trend little bit of a different perspective on the yeah. sanctity of all life. Has he got a booster seat? He does. He does. Have, <laughs> it definitely looks like uh, there's something going on there. Very appealing looking. Balance the risks and rewards here is a difficult thing. The easiest thing you can do is say all damages caused are caused by the pandemic. All of the good things that are happening, like you being alive, that is caused by me, right? It's sort of the Gretchen <laughs> Whitmer strategy in Michigan. And, right. and that's and, and that, that's a very easy thing to say. But in reality, you know, the, not only are there countervailing issues on the other side, such as the fact that, you know, people are going to lose their jobs and their livelihoods and their dreams and quality of life actually matters. But none of these governors Pause are going to keep things locked down forever. I mean, Andrew Cuomo. Sorry, I'm sorry. This is a small point. I think we're all guilty of this sometimes, but countervailing forces on the other side is like a great filler of pseudo intellectualism. He made an actual point there when he's like talking about people losing their jobs and the economic consequences and so forth. And obviously that would be solved if we just gave everybody healthcare and UBI. But do you see how that's like a very intuitive point? There's nothing novel about what he's saying and everybody has observed this across the spectrum. But when you say countervailing forces, that gives you like a patina of you're saying something that's actually new and insightful when you absolutely are not. Anyway. Well, there's like four syllables in that word. Right. And quality of life actually matters. But none of these governors are going to keep things locked down forever. I mean, Andrew Cuomo, when he said just save one life, five days later, he's saying we're going to open up parts of, of New York State. Okay, so which is it? I mean, obviously that means that more people are going to be infected. So you, we're always gonna make this public policy consideration. Nobody just wants to say the obvious truth, which is that we're all making actuarial deductions about what are the costs in terms of how many human lives, how many, how many years of life, because that is an actual issue in actuarial tables, right? If, if somebody who is 81 dies of COVID-19, that is not the same thing as somebody who is 30 dying of COVID-19. I mean, if this were killing children, everyone would be in for lockdown forever. That's the reality, right? If a bunch of five-year-olds were dying of COVID-19 and, and people are saying, get back to work, I'd be like, nope, I'm not letting my five-year-old die. If grandma right. dies in a nursing home at age 81, that's tragic and it's terrible. Also, the life expectancy in the United States is 80. So that, that is not the same thing. In, in moral terms, you want to save every life you can. At the same time, to pretend that Political it is of the terms. same 
it, it is of the same calculation. The age of the person, n- no public policy acts like that. Not a single public policy in American life acts like that. Well, look, I mean, again, I, this is actually a good case, though, of if you're only working against the Andrew Cuomo's of the world, you have a lot of material here. Because it is true that everybody's making calculations like that to some extent. And it is true that if you don't just say, basically, look, if you need to be out working, we're going to treat you incredibly. We're going to quadruple your salary. We're going to give you every protection imaginable. Everybody, and it's going to be federally mandated at severe punishment that Amazon or Target or UPS or, you know, or FedEx or anybody else who gets an inch out of line will face the most punitive, vicious consequences. Everybody's getting everything they need. And everybody else, if you can work from home, a lot of people can, that's fantastic. But it's, if not, you're going to, you know, look, it's going to be interesting. Cool your jets for a year. Here's a couple grand a month. Don't worry about rent. And that's it. I mean, literally, this is no problem. And then, yes, there's macroeconomic questions about, and then several months or a year in, how do you start to open up? How do you balance that with civil liberties? How do you, what are the longer term economic changes with different social habits? Yes, these are big and serious questions. But the choice of rushing a reopening is only created because of austerity policies. And of course, we can talk, I mean, the hypocrisy is obvious and there was all this right-wing fear-mongering about death panels and now it's like a consensus right-wing position to sacrifice grandma's life. However, or you know, risk sacrifice, unless you're, unless you're Ainsley. That being said, if the only argument on the other side is let's just prolong the lockdown without any social strategy, that argument, as despicable as it is, is going to have hay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I like the word austerity because it shows that this is a choice and this choice. is an active thing that they are doing to people. It's not just the way of the world or whatever. Um, it, it's also insane to me that they are willing to throw old people under the bus like this when, by and large, uh, Trump's voter base tends to be more elderly. Um, I guess they're making we'll see. a class calculation. They're making if a enough, class calculation. Yeah, that I wealthier, guess. older people are going to have better health insurance. They're going to be easily, more easily able to self isolate. So I on. mean, they might be right about that. Um, we'll see. Also, when he said actuarial tables, I think wherever he is, Sam just felt a stab of sciatica. <laughs> actuarial table. I like what he said. Well, actuarial tables actually. Yeah, um, yeah, that's why he likes them. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, we're going to sign off. Thank God the internet was working today. Yeah, uh, dance worked. That was very well. Everybody go have a dance. 5.30, uh, we're going to do a really good uh, TMBS stream on Teamster organizing uh, and more. So we'll see that over at the Michael Brooks channel. Uh, guys, everybody stay safe, stay well. And uh, of course, MR is back tomorrow. Take care, guys. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Yeah.